Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited to welcome you to the January edition of KPMG's Social Media Tax Chat. Since 31st December 2021, when President Muhammad Buhari signed the Finance Bill 2021 into law, the Act has been a topical subject amongst taxpayers, tax practitioners, and the general public. The Finance Act 2021 updates some of the amendments introduced in previous Finance Acts and introduces additional changes to several existing laws and legislation. My name is Okwemi Oshuso. I am a senior manager in the tax practice of KPMG Nigeria. My colleague Akinwale Alao, a director in the tax practice of KPMG Nigeria, will be sharing insights on the Finance Act 2021, the key legislative changes and their potential impacts on businesses. Good morning, Akinwale. Good morning, Okwemi. I look forward to engaging with you and with the audience. Okay, great. <laughs> At any point during the session, please feel free to drop your questions or comments in the chat box. We'll try as much as possible if time permits us to respond to your questions. However, if you're unable to respond to your questions due to time constraints, you can send your questions to NGFM Tax Inquiries at ng.kpmg.com. My colleague will drop the email address in the chat box so you can pick it up from there and send your queries if you're unable to attend to them. Um, also, um, we'll be taking a short break at some point during the session for you to stretch out and grab a cup of tea or coffee, and then we will continue with the session. The session will run from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., so please stay glued to your system and or handheld devices. All right. Um, so, Akiwali, we would start with the first question for today on the Finance Act. We know that the Finance Act 2021 is yet to be published in the official Gazette of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, can the public and taxpayers rely on the version of the act that was assented to by the president? If yes, then what is the effective date of the act? Okay, thanks for your questions, Okwemi. Um, from experience, there is usually some time lag between the date when laws and executive orders are signed in Nigeria and when their gazetted copies become publicly available. And so we don't know for a fact whether or not the Finance Act 2021 has been gazetted. What we do know is that the Finance Act 2021 was passed by the Nigerian National Assembly in December 2021 and that the Nigerian president has sent it to the bill in, on the 31st of December 2021. And so based on you know, relevant legislation, that's the Acts Authentication Act and the Interpretation Act in Nigeria, the Finance Bill 2021 became an act of the National Assembly on the 31st of December 2021. It's therefore safe, in my view, for the public and for taxpayers to rely on the signed version of the act, pending when its gazetted version will become publicly available. Now, you know, talking about the effective date of the act, uh, section 41 of the act specifically provides that the act will take effect from the 1st of January 2022, or such other date that will be you know, communicated by the National Assembly or by the president via his assent or in an executive order. Now, we are not aware that the National Assembly or the president has communicated any other date apart from 1st January 2022. So it's safe for taxpayers to uh, proceed on the basis that the effective date of the act is 1st January 2022, pending when the gazetted version of the act would be publicly available. Now, talking about um, gazettes in Nigeria, I, I think what's clear is that we all hope that the Nigerian government would streamline the bureaucratic processes you know, related to the publishing of official gazettes you know, to ensure that when new laws and subsidiary legislation are enacted in Nigeria or are issued, that those gazettes are published on time. You know, the delay in the issuance of those gazettes uh, it's become too frequent, and that's not good for business. You know? So I would pause there for me. 
Thank you. Thank you, Akiwali. So I guess the audience and the general public can rely on the fact that the Finance Act becomes um, effective from 1st of January, 2022. Okay, and um, we know that the Act contains several amendments to existing tax laws and other pieces of legislation. Um, given that the economy and many businesses are still recovering from the impact of the pandemic, would you say that the amendments in the Finance Act are a step in the right direction? Um, are they also in line with global trends? Yeah, thanks for bearing me. Um, no, I, I think it's clear that we can't have a perfect piece of legislation. So all that the lawmakers can hope to do is to work as close to perfection as possible, you know, knowing that there would always be areas of any piece of legislation that is enacted that would still require fine tuning or refinement in future. You know, but if one takes a holistic view of the Finance Act 2021, um, I would say it's, a, it's definitely a step in the right direction. And I would say that the president, the Ministry of Finance, and the working committee that supports the ministry on the annual Finance Act project, they deserve commendation. Um, I think it's clear that Nigeria has a revenue problem, a huge one at that. Uh, the country's dismal tax to GDP ratio of 6% has remained stagnant, for instance, for several years. You know, when you also look at the 2022 Appropriation Act, there's a deficit of about 6.4 trillion, which, which is almost 40% of the 17.13 uh, trillion budget. You know, so debt servicing is almost 35% of total budgeted revenues. So it's clear that you know, Nigeria has a huge revenue problem. So, so at the heart of my view about the Finance Act 2021 is the recognition of the fact that Nigeria's revenue problem requires urgent attention. And the Finance Act 2021 provides the, the legislative architecture, the framework, for the government to mobilize revenues. Um, you know, so, so I think that's why I think it's a step in the right direction. I think it's extremely important for businesses to grow. Uh, however, one has to admit that the solvency and the liquidity of Nigeria as a sovereign state is you know, are critical to the prosperity and continued existence of businesses. If Nigeria fails, then your businesses you know, are going to really struggle. No, I also think that many of the provisions in the Act are they are consistent with global trends. You know what we see in other jurisdictions. You know things like you know the introduction of sugar tax, the taxation of the digital economy. Those are the things that are being done in other other countries. And um, the Finance Act, you know, basically um, goes along those themes are, are, as well. So I, I think I think it's in line with global best practice. Now, what I what I think should be done though is you know, for stakeholders in sectors of the economy that appear to have been negatively affected by the Finance Act to engage with the government and for the government to listen to them dispassionately you know, so that whatever changes that need to be made, maybe even during the course of the year or in the Finance Bill 2022, those changes can be made uh, to ensure that uh, the economy for both the country, for the country, and you know the prosperity of businesses, you know, continue. Thanks, Okwemi. Thank you, Akinwali, for that. Um, just before we take a further deep dive into today's session, uh, we'll have to have a poll, a polling session to just fill the pulse of the audience on the Finance Act. So. Um, to participate in the polling session, my colleague would um, update the screen now. So you can um, bring out your mobile phones and scan the QR code that is on the right side of your screen. If you just take out your phones and put on your cameras, you can scan the QR code that, that's on the right side of your screen. Um, you can also go to the link that would be pasted in the chat box. You can just click on that link 
it will take you straight to the polling session. Or if you're familiar with the tool, you can go to slido.com and just input the number 255622 to participate in the session. So I uh, will just give the audience a few seconds to do that before we go on with the polling session. Akwale, it's really interesting that you talked about um, Nigeria's, um, the problem with the federal government um, raising um, revenue, fiscal revenue, tax revenue. Um, considering that, you know, <laughs> the budget uh, for the 2022 um, tax year is 113 trillion. I think the government really has, the FIRS really has a lot to do to, in terms of raising government revenue. Um, so we see, I think um, the, oh, we have about 35 participants that um, are on the active poll and the numbers keep going up. We have 40, numbers are going up. You can just scan the QR code again. It's on the left side of your screen. I think we would wait till we get to about 60 participants and then we can go on with the poll. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see that uh, majority of people think the Finance Act 2021 will result in an increase in Nigeria's tax to GDP ratio. Um, I it's firmly quite believe interesting. That, I, I firmly believe that. You know, what I would say though is that uh, having a legislative architecture is one thing. The administration of the tax laws is, is another thing. It's a different matter altogether. And it's really important. I think the FRS's job has been cut out for it. Um, it's really important that the FRS steps up in terms of tax administration. Now that it's um, preeminence as the tax authority uh, in Nigeria has been firmly established uh, by statute. Um, and you know, there are a lot of provisions. Uh, it's supposed to administer some new taxes as well. So it's important that the FRS really brings in uh, the money into the co into the coffers of government <laughs> uh, to ensure that the, the potential of the finance act is fully realized. It is very interesting. It's interesting to know that majority of the participants also agree with you that the Finance Act 2021 will increase Nigeria's tax to GDP ratio. I think some analysts believe that it would increase the GDP ratio from 6% to about 10%. So <laughs> let's see how the government does with that. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, um, so the next question, have you evaluated the impact of the Finance Act 2021 on your business? Okay, the numbers are coming. <laughs> we have um, a participant that has put a comment in the chat box saying I chose no because the economy is not expanding and the tax net is not expanding. <laughs> well, well uh, I, I think uh, different people definitely have different perspectives about that issue. But if you look at the quarter three results, um, there was growth in the economy in quarter three and you know, the estimates for the growth in 2021 are about 2% or more, you know, so the economy is growing. It's not growing as fast as we would like. Uh, it's not, it's, the, the expectation is that at the minimum, the economy should be growing at maybe around maybe 6% thereabout for there to be, for, for, the, for its impact, for the impact of the growth to be felt, you know, to creating employment, uh, providing opportunities for wealth creation, capital formation, and all that, you know. So, so I think that's the issue really about the economy is growing. Uh, what has been, what hasn't been growing as quickly or as fast as the economy is the tax accruing to the coffers of government. There are a lot of activities within the Nigerian economy that are not being subjected to tax. Uh, the Finance Act 2021 try, has tried to address some of those. But you know, a lot of those would need to be addressed through tax administration. 
uh, there needs to be an expansion of the tax net in Nigeria. I think that's clear. Yeah. The, 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 um, you know, so I think the, the tax authorities have a, a lot of work to do. I totally agree with you, Akinwale. And I think um, it's almost the, um, most of our participants have evaluated the impact of the Finance Act 2021 on their businesses. Oh, sorry, <laughs> apologies. Most of them have not evaluated the impact of the Finance Act 2021 on their business. So I think this is a very um, right, this is the right place for them to be, to listen to the key changes and also their potential impacts on their business. I think um, the participants would go away with so many things to take on to their businesses. Um, we'll go to the- Just before you move to, okay. Uh, just before you move to to the next question about you know whether participants have have evaluated, I think it's extremely important for businesses to evaluate the impact of the finance act on their on on their operations. You know, I was talking to a client um, last week, for instance, who was asking whether the increase in the tertiary education tax rate uh, in the finance act, if it would apply uh, immediately or if it would apply. Uh, in 2023 and i said you know obviously the, it, it's going to apply mm -hmm. immediately so some of the some some companies have been estimating their tertiary education tax liability on a quarterly basis for instance at the rate of two percent they need to update that that, that uh, because there's been a you know 25 percent increase in the tertiary education tax rate and that needs to be reflected you know, so um, businesses need to, there are so many changes that have been made and there needs to be a thorough evaluation of that so that, you know, uh, businesses are not caught napping and, and the tax team can add value to decision making. I can't agree with you more. Thank you so much, Akiwari. So we'll move on to the next question. Ah, yes. So... We're asking the participants which provisions of the Finance Act 2021 are they most interested in. There is the value added tax obligations for non-resident companies. There's taxation of non-resident companies with significant economic presence on deemed profit basis. Also, there is the clarification Increase in tertiary tax rates that has gone up. <laughs> Introduction of excise duty of 10 naira per liter on non alcoholic carbonated and sweetened beverages. Taxation of for profits, educational institutions, and then clarification on the extension of the period covered by the reduced minimum tax rate. So the numbers are coming in. A lot of our participants are interested in the taxation of non-resident companies with significant economic presence. I think that has the most votes. Okay, but um, it's um, tagging on with introduction of excise duty of 10 Naira on non-alcoholic beverages. So I think I can still say that a lot of our participants are interested in the taxation of non-resident companies. It's very interesting that um, Many of our participants are interested in that particular subject. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it is. Now, I think um, one of the reasons for that may be the news that has come out of the briefing that the Minister of Finance had two weeks ago, um, where there was some, well, maybe to an extent, confusion. Uh, on whether Nigeria was introducing a 6% digital services tax in addition to the current significant economic presence regime, you know, which yeah. isn't the case. You know, and I think you know, we'll talk more about this during the course of, of the tax chat. So I, I would just say that the audience should be seeing it. Or, you know, what I would say for now is uh, globally, there are generally two types of regimes that have been adopted by countries in taxing the digital economy. Some countries have adopted digital services tax, while others have adopted the significant economic presence regime. But what Nigeria has adopted is the significant economic presence regime, and that hasn't changed. So there is no new 6% digital services tax. Now, what has simply happened 
is you know, that the provisions in the law that relate to significant economic presence uh, in terms of administration and the powers of the tax authorities have been updated. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about you know, the updates to the Companies Income Tax Act. Thank you, Akumali. I think um, we have to do a deep dive on the taxation of non-resident companies <laughs> in Nigeria because a lot of, the, the a lot of our participants are interested in that. <laughs> yes, a lot of them that. are interested in that. Okay, um, well, we'll be taking the questions on under key thematic areas and um, we will start with capital gains tax. So, Akumali, my first question for you is, um, that um, we know that the Finance Act has um, kind of partially rolled back the gains from the disposal of shares, the exemption enjoyed um, from gains on disposal, disposal of shares. Um, according to the Finance Act, I will just read it here. Um, gains accruing to a person on disposal of its shares in any Nigerian company will now be chargeable to CGT, except under specific scenarios one of which is where the disposal proceeds in aggregates is less than 100 million in any 12 consecutive months and provided the person making the disposal renders appropriate returns on an annual basis. Now, um, gains from disposal of shares have enjoyed this exemption from, um, from CGT since 1998. Um, what is your view on the partial rollback of the CGT exemption, do you think this amendment will adversely impact the growth of the Nigerian equity market? Interesting question. Um, you know, as you rightly mentioned, the exemption of shares from CGT was introduced in 1998. You now that's 25 years ago. Um, I think a quarter of a century is long enough time uh, for allowing a fiscal policy to bear its to bear its fruit, uh, I don't think the partial rollback will affect the growth of the Nigerian equity market negatively. I don't think so. I think the market has grown significantly. I think the market has become more sophisticated than it was in 1998. Uh, I think the market you now has grown even in terms of liquidity, uh, in terms of the in terms of of um, the the players, uh, the, the, it's 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 a deep market. So I don't think this change would affect it negatively. If you look, for instance, at the all share index of the Nigerian stock exchange, you know, or the Nigerian exchange as it's now called, you know, in 1998, you know, in December 1998, the all share index was 6,000 points. You now, as at yesterday, it was 44,400 points. You know? So it, that it's it's grown by about a seven hundred percent. The market capitalization has also risen over the years. You know, it's currently standing at about twenty four trillion naira. So we are talking about a market that's one of the best um, in the in Africa. You know, um, when you also look at the performance in terms of um, of um, capital appreciation of players in the market, you would see, for instance, you know, during 2021, there was an FMCG stock that grew by over 105%. You know, there was uh, an oil and gas stock that grew by over 60%. You know, so the market is doing well. Um, and I think many of the players in the market will continue to play even with the introduction of the, of the um, CGT, you know, and you know, I'll just give you two reasons, uh, two more reasons. You know, one is many of the players that are being targeted. It's the players that are being targeted are not the mom and pop investors. They are not, yeah. you know, they are not small players. Um, it's high net worth individuals. It's uh, institutional investors that are being targeted by this provision, and many of these players are already familiar with taxation you know, of, of gains derived from stocks in other jurisdictions that you're operating. You know, so they're not going to uh, lose the opportunities for wealth creation you know, and, and, and capital appreciation that they have in the Nigerian stock market just because of a 10% uh, CGT. And even that 
you know, because there are also opportunities, you know, in the way the CGT will be accounted for, there are opportunities to reinvest. So, so if it, if there's reinvestment, then there will be some form of rollover relief. So, so I, I think the the provisions are are good, and um, they would if they are properly implemented, they would result in an increase in CGT uh, collection by the tax authorities. And I don't think they would negatively impact impact the economy. You know, I think the, the other reason uh, to look at, you know, is the, you know the fact that um, those who play in the market, you know, they would continue to engage, you know, with the tax authorities um, and with the government generally. So if it turns out that the impact is negative, I'm sure uh, you know stakeholders, you know whether the securities and exchange level or the adjunct stock exchange level, you know, can engage with relevant authorities or with government you know, to ensure that whatever changes are required are also made. Thank you, Akimari. Um, just to remind the participants that you can drop in your questions or comments in the chat box. We would like to hear from you, We'd like to hear your views on um, the capital gains tax amendments. Yeah, so Akimwale, um, the other question I have for you is on the 12 consecutive months that has been stated in the Act. And if I can just go over that again, um, the Act says that the CGT gains accruing to a person on disposal of its shares in any Nigerian company will be chargeable to CGT except under specific scenarios, one of which is where the disposal proceeds in aggregate is less than 100 million in any 12 consecutive months. Now, how will the 12 consecutive months be determined given that the act does not specifically state when the 12 consecutive months would be deemed to commence? Um, will it be the first of the 12 consecutive months from the month in which the first set of shares were disposed or will it be the first month in the affected financial year of the company? Or is it even the first month in the government fiscal year, which is um, 1st of January? So if you can just please clarify that. Okay, thanks, Opremi. Um, I think this provision is uh, a bit ambiguous and it's open to different interpretations, uh, you know, even from the examples that you have cited, uh, the provision is open to different interpretations. I think it's one of the provisions that the Federal Inland Revenue Service needs to clarify when it issues its uh, circular on the CGT related provisions of the Finance Act 2021. Um, it would be good to know the how the 12 consecutive months would work. If I would you know, as had a guess, you know, just to express my own view. You know, I am of the view that the intention of the lawmakers is for taxpayers to evaluate whether or not they met the threshold on a rolling basis. You know, mm -hmm. so I think it would be good, uh, for instance, for the Federal and Land Revenue Service, the provision says that taxpayers will need to provide information, will need to submit a return annually. I think it would be good for the tax authority to specify a 31st December deadline for the filing of that annual return. And you know, the reason for that, the logic behind that, you know, is these amendments that are, since it's coming from the Finance Act is effective from 1st of January, 2022. Uh, if taxpayers are filing a return, by the end of the year, you know, at least for the first 12 months, you know, they'll be able to evaluate and you know make a declaration in the return whether or not they traded to the tune of a hundred million naira. Um, that's in terms of disposal of shares during the year in that return. And then subsequently, I think um, what should be done, my expectation is that for instance, when taxpayers submit their return for this in December 2023, uh, they would need to also evaluate not just whether they uh, have traded up to or they've disposed of up to uh, 100 million naira mm -hmm. worth of share in for, in the period 1st January 2023 to 31st December 2023. They will need to check 
no, as at January 2023, the 12 months ended January 2023, did they dispose shares of up to 100 million? If they did, then in that December 2023 return, whatever tax that needs to be paid should be accounted for. You know, so that evaluation needs to be done. As at February 2023, did they dispose of shares up to 100 million? As at March 2023, so they will need to do the evaluation you know, on, on a monthly basis during the period to which the return relates. So that if at any point during the period that they are filing a return in respect of, as at the end of any of the months during that period, if they've traded up to a hundred million and they are liable to CGT, then they should pay the CGT. You know, but, but, and obviously guidance would need to be provided by the tax authority. Guidance, I think, also needs to be provided in respect of the format in which the return will be filed um, and in respect of the timeline. I would, I would suggest the 31st December timeline. You know, currently taxpayers file their CGT returns twice a year. That's as at 30th June and as at 31st of December of the of the relevant year of assessment, you know, whichever the date is closest to when the disposal happened. So I think uh, taxpayers can include information on shares disposed of in the December return, if that's in line with the guidance provided by the tax authorities. Thank you so much, Akinwale. Um, we've got some questions in the chat box. Um, a participant is asking, um, how do you determine the purchase price in, in determining capital gains? Will it be the brought forward figure for that year or will it be the starting figure from January, 2022? Um, will they also be using weighted average method or first in first out method? Um, the other question is, what does the CGT Act say with respect to computation of such gains where the sales proceed is rolled over into another investment and not charged CGT? And then the new investment is divested. So which purchase, the, the participant wants to know which purchase consideration um, in the following year will be used in determining the capital gains tax. Okay. You know, very good questions. Um, in determining the CGT, just like in determining CGT generally, it is uh, the sale proceeds that you know you derive from the shares that you then compare with the historical cost you know, of the shares. So whatever shares have been purchased that were disposed of, uh, it would be possible at any point in time. You know, to determine the actual cost relating to the shares that were disposed of. Um, if that's not clear, maybe the tax authorities may then you know, have to provide guidance whether it would be last uh, first in first out uh, basis that will be used in determining the shares that were disposed of. You know, that may be necessary. That guidance will be necessary. Uh, given that you know, over the last two and a half decades, you know, taxes haven't been computed on gains derived from shares, there is really no established practice when it comes to you know, calculating gains derived from set of shares in Nigeria. And so that guidance will be relevant uh, from the tax authorities. Um, you know, but I think one just needs to look at the overall intention of the lawmakers in making the amendment, you know, which is to ensure that um, if shares have been sold, if they are reinvested, then there will be some relief similar to the way rollover relief is computed. So just you know, like rollover relief is typically computed for other assets, you know, where the disposal, the proceeds from the disposal, are reinvested in that stock or a similar stock. You now, based on the amendment that was made, then there will be relief. So you know, rollover in calculating rollover relief normally you look at the sales proceeds. Um, you know, and then you deduct the cost of acquisition of the of the of the asset, the chargeable asset that was disposed of, which in this case will be the shares that were disposed of. And then you know the net amount that you have, you deduct the lower of either the sale proceeds or the amount reinvested. Also, if the the gain derived from the disposal of the shares is higher than the amount reinvested, then obviously there will be a net capital gain that will be subjected to tax at 
But if the gain from the disposal is lower than the than the uh, amount reinvested, then you know it's clear that the amount the gain that was derived was rolled over, and as a result of that, there will be a deferral of the capital gains tax payable on that gain. You know, so so that's you know just just generally speaking, that's how it's going to work. Uh, but the tax authorities would obviously need to provide further guidance uh, on this issue. And they are empowered to do so based on the, fire of the FRS Establishment Act. So I believe it's something, it's an administrative issue relating to filing of returns, you know, that they can actually provide guidance on. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you, Akimali. I think the FRS really has um, a lot on their plate. This, um, tax year, especially with providing clarification on the partial rollover of um, capital gains tax. Um, another question from uh, participants is that um, with respect to capital gains tax for cooperatives and employee savings schemes participating in equity, equities markets, to whom will the tax be payable to? Okay, so I think maybe that's also another area that will need to be clarified. But you know, just generally speaking, the way capital gains tax is you know, uh, administered is such that if the gain um, is, has been derived by a corporate entity, then the capital gains tax is payable to the Federal Land Revenue Service. And if the gain has been derived by an individual, then the capital gains tax will be paid to the state tax authority of the state where the individual is tax resident. So if you have a cooperative, um, which I would expect maybe to comprise uh, in, in individuals, you know, that means you know, when, when the cooperative has derived a gain um, for investing in shares and you know, disposing of shares, it is really not the cooperative that has derived the gain, it's the participants, it's the members of the cooperative. So, you know, when the gain is apportioned, when it's shared amongst the members, then each of the members would need to file their CGT returns um, you know, on self-assessment basis uh, with their state tax authorities of, of the states they are tax resident in. And if, if, if the cooperative, for instance, you know, it's unlikely, but if it includes a company or a corporate entity, um, then that the gain relating to that, the share of the gain relating to that company would need to be uh, paid to, would, would need to be assessed to capital gains tax and that tax will be paid to the Federal Land Revenue Service. So, so I think that's how it would work generally. It's about determining the gain and apportioning the gain to the beneficiaries. It's the beneficiaries of the gain, just like you have in a unit trust type arrangement. It's the real beneficiaries of the gain that are being subjected to tax. Uh, and those are the beneficiaries that need to account for the tax to the tax authorities. Great, thank you so much, Akiwari. Um, no. So I think we will move on to the next um, thematic area, which is um, value added tax. And I know a lot of participants will be interested in this question um, based on section 10 of the VAT Act. Um, it has been amended for the third year in a row. Um, and based on this amendment, FIRS has essentially been empowered to appoint non-resident suppliers, making taxable supplies to taxable persons in Nigeria as VAT collection agents. What's your take on this amendment? It's a good amendment. I think it's a good amendment. And, you know, and I think it's clear from the fact that, you know, there have only been three finance acts uh, since Nigeria returned to a democratic uh, system. And in those three finance acts, section 10 has been amended. You know, what that says is maybe there are complexities in section 10 that as they have been amended and as you know, the Nigerian legislature tries to address those complexities, they find that there are other issues that need to be clarified. And you know, that's good. That's why countries uh, have annual finance acts so that they can easily tweak the provisions of the law to address loopholes or to clarify issues. Um, 
you know, before the amendment of, of Section 10 by the Finance Act 2021, a number of foreign digital service providers had actually been reaching out to the Federal Land Revenue Service for them to be appointed as VAT collection agents. And so it, it wasn't out of place that you know the Nigerian legislature thought that it was necessary for for foreign digital service providers to be appointed as VAT collection agents because there was some seeming contradiction in section 10 of the VAT Act, you know, which made it look like, you know, if one were to go with the literal interpretation of the section without considering other provisions of other pieces of legislation, you know, it, it, it's difficult to, to read it in a way that would make the tax authority, that would empower the tax authority to appoint the foreign supplier as the VAT collection agent. It looked like it had to be someone else aside from that foreign supplier. But with the way the VAT Act Section 10 now has been amended, it's possible for the supplier to be appointed as the collection agent. agent. And you know, that would address a lot of tax leakages uh, because currently many, many, of the, many of the customers you know, doing business with foreign digital service providers, they are consumers, not businesses. They are individuals, you know, people subscribing to Netflix, to Screed, uh, to, you know, to different applications and, you know, they pay. But because of the way Section 10 was awarded, uh, the foreign suppliers could not, could not collect Nigerian VAT. At best, they would charge yeah. the VAT, they could charge the VAT and they were obligated to check the VAT since they were obligated to register for VAT, but they couldn't collect because based on the law, um, Nigerian taxable person that procured the service that had the obligation to remit the VAT to the tax authorities. So there was a lot of VAT that was not being remitted to the tax authorities, but with the new provision, you know, foreign digital suppliers, you know, they have an obligation to register for tax, they have an obligation to charge the VAT, they have the obligation to collect the VAT and to remit the VAT to the tax authorities. You know, um, the, law, the law provides that the tax authority would have the power to issue guidelines to appoint them. Uh, the tax authority had already issued guidelines in October of 2021, appointing foreign digital su suppliers of uh, services and intangibles as VAT collection agents. So, now, foreign digital service providers don't need to wait for any guidance anymore. It's likely that the tax authority would revise that guideline, but that would just be a simple revision. The, the import of the guideline has already come into force. And you know, it's important that foreign digital service providers begin to discharge that obligation from this month of January. Otherwise, you know, they would be in contravention of the law and you know, they may be exposed to penalties. Absolutely, absolutely. I remember um, one of my colleagues that said, uh, told me that even Netflix has started charging VAT, so they're already in compliance with the law. So I guess we'll get to see more of that um, as we go on in the year. And there's so many questions from participants on this VAT being okay. uh, collected by non-resident companies. So um, one question is, who is liable for VAT payments on services sold by foreign companies to local VAT registered businesses? Okay, so um, based on the current what you have to I, I think maybe it won't take a step back. I think the major leakage that the amendment sought to fix was in respect of B2C transactions, yeah. um, business to consumer transactions not really business to business transactions. But if we want to look at the provision of section 10, the amended provision of section 10 as it is, it does not distinguish between B2C transactions and B2B transactions as far as supplies from foreign service providers uh, is concerned, so are, are concerned. There's no distinction in the law. Um, you know, so, to the extent that foreign suppliers have now been appointed, or the tax authority has been empowered to appoint foreign suppliers, and the tax authority has appointed foreign suppliers. You now, the obligation uh, is twofold. 
the obligation to collect the VAT would rest on the foreign suppliers. However, based on section 10, where the foreign supplier does not discharge that obligation, the obligation would then be on the local company or the local business that is procuring the service. So, so that way, the tax authorities, well, or the Nigerian government can ensure that there's no leakage. If the foreign supplier doesn't collect and remit the VAT, then the Nigerian business that has procured the service needs to self-account for the VAT. Um, so, so, so that's that's the that's what the law says now. Yeah. So essentially, uh, when it comes to business to business transaction, the Nigerian company would still have that obligation where the foreign company does not charge or um, collect the VAT. Um, another question is that does this mean that all non-resident companies making supplies into Nigeria must, in uh, inverted commas, register for Nigerian VAT, even where the supply is business to business? Well, based on section 10 of the VAT Act, you know, that's what it says. Um, that's why, and you know, not just, you won't, you know, one, one needs to look holistically at the provisions of the VAT Act. When you look at the amendments that have been made in the Finance Act 20, 2019 regarding the charging section of the VAT Act, regarding the place of supplier rules, regarding the time of supplier rules, and then the changes that have been made regarding transactions between non-resident suppliers and, um, you know, businesses or you know, consumers in Nigeria, and, you know, taxable persons in Nigeria. Um, it's clear, you know, that foreign suppliers, as long as the supply is being concluded in Nigeria, they have an obligation to register for VAT, Nigerian VAT. Now, one needs to make a distinction between supply of goods on the one hand and supply of services on the other hand, because I mean, when you, have, when you look at supply of services, you know, once the supply is consumed in Nigeria, um, the transaction is concluded in Nigeria. And so the question of whether the foreign digital service provider has an obligation to register is, is kind of, you know, it, it's easy to answer because the foreign digital service provider, you know, is concluding a transaction in Nigeria as far as the VAT Act in Nigeria is concerned. And that foreign digital service provider has an obligation to charge VAT. In order to charge VAT, the foreign digital service provider needs to register, and Section 10 is clear about that. So they have an obligation to register for VAT, to charge VAT. Um, and before now, they also they, they simply had an obligation to file returns, you know, you know, so, so that at least if the VAT was withheld as well by the Nigerian uh, taxpayer or the Nigerian taxable person, they will be able to show that, you know, the return they are finding is just a new return they, you know, to demonstrate that they did not collect the VAT. But now, they now have an obligation to collect the VAT and to, you know, to, to remit the VAT. So, so that they are, the obligations of foreign digital service providers has, has now increased um, really. So, so that means the most for those, for foreign digital suppliers of goods, I think that's another question altogether. And even in the clarification, the guideline that was issued by the tax authority, the timeline that has been set for that to come into force is 1st of January, 2024. And I think that's in recognition of the fact that the rules around supply of goods are, are more complicated because, I mean, when the goods come into Nigeria, you know, at the port of entry into Nigeria, VAT needs to be accounted for. So if, if VAT has been accounted for at the time the goods are being procured, and VAT will still need to be accounted for at the time the goods are shipped into Nigeria, then there's going to be a problem because that's double VAT, and that cannot be the correct interpretation of the law. So a lot of uh, review needs to be done, a lot of analysis needs to be done to ensure that Nigeria doesn't create, you know, and, uh, or doesn't introduce a provision that will result in double incidence of VAT. So for now, as long as the supply of the goods is, is not concluded within Nigeria, um, the foreign digital supply of the goods uh, will not have an obligation to, you know, charge VAT on the supply of those goods. If the foreign digital supplier is the one responsible for 
shipping the goods into Nigeria and the transaction is effectively concluded in Nigeria, then obviously at the port of entry into Nigeria, VAT will be accounted for. And you know, at the point of supply, you know, VAT will be accounted for, and then the foreign digital supplier uh, can you know use the input output mechanism to address whatever VAT issue that results from that. Okay, so thank you so much, yeah. Akimali. Okay. Yes, I think that's very clear. Um, just to re-emphasize that um, based on the provisions of Section 10, um, non-resident companies would need to register for VAT um, in order to charge the VAT. And when they when they, they have been appointed as collection agents, then um, they would also need to remit the VAT. There's so many questions here on... Um, VAT chart by non-resident companies. I think some of them have already been answered in your discussion. Um, there is one um, that is, this is more of a, an implementation um, or administration question. And it says that if the VAT is deducted by the consumer for a non-resident company, um, so that if the VAT is deducted at source, um, given that remittance is now done online, what tax identification number will be used to remit this VAT to the um, tax authorities? That is if the non-resident company is not registered for taxes in Nigeria. Okay, so, um, so the question is, if the VAT is deducted at source by the, by the, the vendor, Nigerian right? company. Yes, by the Nigerian by the, vendor. Okay. Or, or by the Nigerian, Nigerian consumer, customer. sorry. Okay, by the Nigerian, Nigerian customer. Okay. okay, so if the VAT, so, you know, just to you know, recap, my understanding of that question is, you have a foreign supplier that has supplied services, for instance, to a Nigerian yes. customer. That yeah. foreign supplier, maybe because the foreign supplier is not registered for VAT or because the foreign supplier uh, does not demand the VAT, uh, the VAT has not been accounted for by the foreign supplier. And the, the secondary responsibility you know, now falls on the Nigerian customer to account for the VAT. Um, sure. you know, I think that's pretty easy. When it comes to VAT remittance, the tax identification number of the supplier of the service is not required for the purpose of remittance. You know, all that is required for the purpose of remittance is the tax identification number of the person remitting the tax. And that's all that's, and the, of course, the amount that is to be remitted. And so the Nigerian customer uh, needs to just self-account for, for v, the VAT using its own TIN, and then it will get a VAT receipt evidencing the remittance that it has made, so that during the tax audit by the tax authorities, it will be able to demonstrate that there was no VAT leakage. VAT has been duly accounted for on that transaction. And you know, obviously, depending on the nature, you know, since this VAT on service, you know, obviously the, the 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 Nigerian customer will be able to take a company's income tax deduction for that VAT because it's an it's a legitimate expense. expense. You know, it needs to be deducted for corporate income tax purposes. Yes, thank you, Akivali. I agree with you. Um, I think there's one interesting question here. It says that if um, the NRC doesn't register for VAT and then the Nigerian customer then uh, deducts that VAT and remits it on behalf of the non-resident company, that does this mean that the non-resident company is actually not um, non-compliant with the VAT um, provision, but rather the penalty should would, should be imposed on the NRC for non-compliance to um, register for taxes as against non-compliance to um, submit VAT returns since the VAT has actually been paid by the Nigerian customer. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, I think what's clear is there are two parties involved here. Yeah? There is the foreign supplier, and that foreign supplier has its own obligations, and there are consequences for not living up to, you know, for not complying with the provisions of the law, for not living up to the expectation set out in the in, in the statutory provisions. 
there are consequences for not registering for VAT. There are penalties for that. There are penalties for not charging VAT, very severe penalties you know, for not charging VAT. Um, there are penalties for not collecting VAT where you know, a taxpayer has been appointed as the collection agent. So the foreign suppliers need to bear that in mind. And you, know, you don't want to be um, at the mercy of the tax authorities when it comes to enforcement of the provisions of the law. Now, when, when it comes to the Nigerian company, so I think one thing that needs to be clear here is that the party that actually bears the brunt of VAT on this transaction is the Nigerian customer that is enjoying the service or that is procuring the, the service or the intangible. Sure. That is the party that is bearing the brunt. So when you talk about um, accounting for the VAT, it's really, you know, VAT that would otherwise have been paid over to the non-resident company that is now being paid over directly to the tax, Nigerian tax authority. That's what the reverse charge mechanism um, is really about, you know, where um, it's also under section 14. It's all been in the oil and gas industry for a long time. So, so it's really not new. Um, it's just that because many of the Nigerian um, customers that were responsible for accounting for VAT had not been doing that over time. That's why the tax authorities are looking to foreign foreign suppliers since, you know, because maybe because they are multinationals, they have a more established tax practice, they are less likely to um, to engage in tax evasion. Maybe they will be more, more responsible in accounting for the VAT. So even though the VAT has been accounted for in this, in the example that's or in the question, um, you know, accounted for by the Nigerian by the Nigerian customer, the foreign supplier may still be exposed to penalties. And you know, that's something foreign companies need to avoid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Akinwale. Um, I think we'll move on to the next question. Um, as we're already halfway into the session, um, and then after that, we'll take a short break. Um, when we look at um, the amendment to section 30 of CETA um, with respect to application of deemed rates on non-resident digital businesses, um, what are the implications of this amendment for non-resident digital businesses that have significant economic presence in Nigeria? Does the amendment imply that such companies are no longer required to prepare financial statements or compute income tax liabilities on actual profit basis? Okay, thanks, Okoyemi. No, I think the first point that needs to be made regarding the amendment to Section 30 of CETA is that Section 30 is an anti-avoidance provision, not a self-assessment provision. You know, and, and that's very important. Um, Section 30 is a provision that empowers the tax authority uh, to calculate you know, the accessible profits and the tax payable by a company under certain scenarios. Um, and it doesn't stop or it doesn't obviate the, the obligation for the Nigerian taxpayer or for the taxpayer, any taxpayer, whether Nigerian or foreign, to file self-assessment returns, you know, so, so it's important to note that uh, Section 30 is not shifting the responsibility for determining taxes on the tax authority. It's just saying, file your tax returns, you know, but the tax authorities would review the returns and, you know, they may have a different view and there can be a query, there can be discussion about that. So I think that's the first point I would like to make that. Section 30 is an anti-avoidance provision. It's not a self-assessment provision. The self-assessment provision in the Companies Income Tax Act remains in uh, Section 55 of the Act. And based on that section, non-resident companies you know, that have significant economic presence in Nigeria, they are still required to file their Companies Income Tax returns annually. They are still required, and as part of that return, they are required to prepare uh, financial statements for their Nigerian operations. Those financial statements need to be attested by a Nigerian 
our accounting firm, um, they are required as part of that return to also submit their global audited financial statements and to also submit self-assessment forms, you know, in the format uh, um, required by the tax authorities. You know, so, so those are provisions in Section 55. They are also required to prepare their company's income tax computation on actual profit basis. So, so those are require, requirements of, of Section 55. Um, those returns need to be filed and they would reflect whatever profits the company has made on a profit basis. Now, you know, connected to that, of course, is the fact that you know, when companies file companies income tax returns in Nigeria, they also, you know, based on the transfer pricing regulations in Nigeria, they have some obligations you know, um, to file uh, transfer pricing, declaration forms, disclosure forms, and depending on their, their the turnover threshold you know, of the business. So if, for instance, you have a non-resident company you know, that uh, is a member of a multinational group with consolidated revenue of 160 billion naira or 750 million euro, you know, that, that foreign company operating in Nigeria, um, would have country by country returns filing obligations. You know, so, so those are obligations that foreign companies uh, with significant economic presence would have in Nigeria. Now, after filing their companies income tax returns, what section 30 simply means uh, in simple terms is that the tax authorities can review those returns. And if the tax authorities um, are not satisfied with the accessible profits in the returns, or maybe uh, they are not satisfied with, with uh, you know, the documentation that supports the computation, the tax authorities may assess the foreign company to tax on a fair and reasonable percentage of the turnover of that foreign company. You know, of course, it's the Nigeria sourced turnover, not the global turnover of the foreign company. It's the turnover of the Nigerian operations of the foreign company. So the tax authorities can assess that foreign company to tax on a fair and reasonable percentage of its Nigeria sourced uh, turnover. You know, based on what the Minister of Finance has said, um, Nigeria seems um, keen on applying the dim profit, you know, the effective tax rate of 6% has been applied based on a dim profit percentage of 20% and you know, the standard tax rate of 30%. You know, that's what the Minister of Finance has indicated. You know, my own personal view is that foreign suppliers, you know, foreign digital businesses need to engage with the Nigerian you know, tax authorities and with the Ministry of Finance, um, you know, and maybe demonstrate why the 6% rate may be, it may be considered excessive. Uh, because when you look at the rates being applied, yeah, granted Nigeria doesn't apply digital services tax. So when you look at the effective tax rate, when you look at what is obtainable in other countries of the world, you're looking at things like 1%, 2%, 3%. You know, so if Nigeria is trying to apply 6%, you know, when for two companies that don't have any physical operations in Nigeria, that may be seen as a bit excessive, but it, the, the onus would be on the digital service uh, players to engage with the Nigerian tax authorities and with the Ministry of Finance and have a conversation around the implementation of, of the act and maybe demonstrate why the 6% has been applied over time to non-resident companies shouldn't have, with physical operations, shouldn't apply to non-resident companies that only have digital operations in Nigeria just because they have customers in Nigeria. So, so I think it's important to have that engagement because the tax is not, the tax is here to stay. I think the taxation of the digital economy in Nigeria is here to stay. And, you know, all that can be done is for there to be engagement to ensure that the administration of the tax is done in a manner that is equitable and sustainable. Um, so I think that, that's what needs to be done really with respect to that. Thank you, Akumale. Um, I think we'll take a short break now. Um, just so that you can stretch out and grab another cup of coffee or tea and biscuits uh, to before we commence the session again. Learn on the go and stay informed. Our goal is to keep the average user informed and up to date with relevant tax information. For the entrepreneur and investor, 
Getting acquainted with tax laws and regulations could be quite daunting. Well, not anymore. Introducing the KPMG Tax Mobile app, where you can access all tax-related news, laws, and insights in one place. Also, calculating personal income taxes has never been quicker. To get the app, simply search for KPMG Nigeria Tax on Google Play Store or iOS Store and install. Once installed, quickly do a one-time sign-up on the application to access a constantly updated library of news, laws, and articles alongside easy-to-use tools. The KPMG Tax Mobile app has a minimalist design, making it effortless to use and navigate. What's more, if you can't find what you need, asking a professional is as fast as it gets. Let's walk you through the application. The full menu is accessible from the left and helps you jump to any part of the application in seconds. Access fresh tax news by clicking on the news icon. The seamless crew makes it simple to view all news at a glance. You have news you've already seen and want to go back to? Just search. Expand or share each news item to your friends with the dedicated buttons. Adjust your news preference easily from the settings icon and tailor your content. We have embedded tax legislation and popular cases in our tax laws section. Are you eager to know more about taxation in Nigeria? KPMG Tax App has more than enough for you. Stay on the cutting edge of industry updates with insights features. The new app brings together alerts, newsletters, articles and publications from industry-leading KPMG professionals. You don't have to worry about missing important regulatory dates and other notable events. The notable date feature brings them all into one place in a calendar or list however you want to view them. For the average employee, entrepreneur or business person, KPMG Tax App has another important feature, the PIT Calculator. Plug and play, simple as it gets. Impute the required numbers and calculate your taxes. Also, the app has jokes and valuable tips. Check in to learn something new and fun. Still feel there's more to know? We've got your back. Ask an expert and get quick, insightful responses from KPMG professionals when in doubt. Learn more from various authorities through recommended links in the external links tab. Read all about us to find out more about KPMG's service offerings, our responsible tax principles, and disclaimer. It's now a breeze to connect with us online. Just click on the link icon on the homepage to get to us on social media. KPMG Talks Up, connecting with you on the go. All right, welcome back to the KPMG social media tax chat. Um, just to remind the participants that you can go on the App Store, if you're using iOS, go on the App Store and search for KPMG tax mobile app, or you can go on the Play Store if you're using Android to search for the app and download it. It's very, very, it's a very, very great app for you to use. You have your tax laws on the go and you can just check on it when you need to confirm one or two things and you also have the pit calculator for free you don't need to pay anything i just need to um chip that in okay so um akimale welcome again um thank you i think we'll move on to the next set of questions which is on um, educational institutions um one of the major changes made by the finance act 2021 um to the cit is the is the exclusion of the words educational institution from section 23 1c of the act what is the implication of this amendment for schools and educational institutions particularly those that are set up as limited liability companies? Interesting question. And you know, I think I've seen a lot of uh, chats about, or comments in the chat box about um, participants that are interested in this subject. No, you know, I, I think it's a notable amendment um, and 
just looking at the amendment on the surface, it is easy to come to the conclusion that all educational institutions are now taxable, but I don't think that's the correct conclusion to come to. Now, I think that provision needs to be looked at and interpreted in a purposive manner. Uh, the question is, what was the mischief that the law was, or the lawmakers were seeking to cure? Um, and you know, what's the, and you know, basically look at it using the mis mischief role and look at you know what was the mystery that was to be cured and what has now been done um from the provision of the law ecclesiastical and um, charitable organizations are still exempted from tax so you could have a situation where an educational institution is in fact a charitable organization and you know that may be the case where you have not-for-profit um you know uh, educational institutions uh, educational institutions that are registered as, uh, you know, limited by guarantee, for instance, you know, I believe strongly that it will still be exempted and that that's the intention of the lawmakers. I mean, at the end of the day, the finance bill 2021 was an executive bill and, you know, submitted by the Ministry of Finance and the clarification that has come from the Ministry of Finance is that the intention in making the amendment to section 23.1c was to exclude limited liability companies that are carrying on educational business you know from exemption now the intention is not for the for 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 nigeria to now start to now start taxing you know not for profit educational institutions so you know where you have a, an educational institution that is a limited liability company based on the amendment that educational institution will now become taxable uh, based on the amendment however if you have an educational institution that is maybe limited for limited by guarantee, for instance, then that educational institution would need to demonstrate to the tax authorities that it is not a not-for-profit organization. It does not have, uh, it does not really, from an accounting point of view, what is as will be surplus, not even profit, because I mean, what they prepare is not a profit or loss account. What limited uh, companies limited by guarantee would prepare, for instance, is a surplus or deficit account. You know, so those companies, you know, is to demonstrate, maybe show the certificate of incorporation, you know, show the financials, you know, show that it is also of a public character. And you know, Finance Act 2020 made an amendment in that regard about you know, what it and what it means to be an educational institution of public character. Now, that means it is registered in accordance with the relevant law and it does not distribute or share its profit in any manner to its members or promoters. So, you know, that would be the responsibility of, of educational institutions that, you know, are charitable organizations. That would be their own responsibility to demonstrate to the tax authorities that they are still covered by the exemption because they are they are charitable organizations and you know just to point out that registering as as a charitable organization in nigeria is is not that straightforward uh, for a company to be a company limited by guarantee the incorporation process actually involves an approval from the office of the attorney general of the federation so it's not something that's straightforward it's not something that just anybody can get easily and you know the reason why that kind of bureaucratic process is in place is to ensure that companies that Put themselves forward as charitable organizations are indeed charitable organizations and if there are exemptions that are available to them those exemptions need to be accorded to them you know so if i'll just summarize limited liability companies that are involved in educational institution you know that are carrying on uh, you know educational business or education business they will be taxable going forward um but educational institutions that are charitable organizations they will still be eligible for exemption if they can demonstrate that they are indeed you know, not for profit, they are indeed charitable organizations. You are mute. A question okay. here, a question here um, from a participant um, who is concerned with the effect of the amendment on educational institutions in Nigeria. The question is what would you advise educational institutions to do? Given this, um, uh, given the um, fact that they are no longer exempt from 
um, CIT? Well, um, I would advise education institutions to comply with the law. Uh, you know, so if they are required to pay tax under the law, you know, then they should pay tax. Now, I think um, the underlying assumption here is for you to pay tax, you have to make profit. We know that many of the education institutions, many, not all, many, are not even profitable. Uh, we know how challenging the terrain is. I, I provide service to, you know, educational clients that are educational institutions, and I know it's very, it's a very challenging business. So if those companies are not even making profits to start with, then they won't pay tax. You know, and whatever losses they have, they will carry those losses forward. But educational institutions that, you know, are set up as for profit organizations, like as limited liability companies, if they make profit then they should pay tax, they should pay tax. Um, I mean, there's always room for tax planning and you know, the, the companies can consider that and we would be happy to, to engage with companies. So one is to evaluate the needs and the objectives of companies on a case by case basis. You know, so that, you know, if there is advice and, and obviously uh, there would be ways of managing companies, educational institutions or educational companies tax or tax uh, exposure and legitimate ways. And you know, those can obviously be explored. But I would say my general comment would be educational companies should comply with the provisions of the law, uh, but you know, they, are, they would only be liable to tax if they make profit. And if they are not profitable, then they won't pay any tax. They won't pay company, corporate income tax. You know, they may be liable to other taxes. Absolutely, absolutely, Akimali. And I think um, for the educational institutions, it's actually instructive for them to seek the help of professionals at this point, especially given the fact that um, this is the first time that um, they will be paying taxes and company, companies in tax. So it's actually instructive for them to do that so that um, they're also planning their taxes efficiently. Okay, uh, Okwemi, if I may just comment on that. Um, you know, the tax authorities sometimes take a view that's slightly different, you know, to basically say, um, say um, these educational institutions have always been liable to tax uh, based, based on the judicial precedents available. Um, I think one needs to continue to watch. Um, there's a case that there was said by the Court, court of Appeal um, one would need to also look at that, you know, in considering all of mm. this. And then hopefully, maybe when the Supreme Court rules on that case, uh, there would be clear guidance because clearly that would be that would be binding precedent, obviously. Um, and it maybe it will settle the matter. As things stand, that issue is still not fully settled. Um, and, you know, Generally, when one looks at the provisions of Section 23 before the amendment by the Finance Act 2021, if the law said educational institutions, you know, profits derived by a company that is an educational institution, then I mean, one should look at the wording of the law, one should look at the provision of the law and interpret it as such. So, if the educational institution was a limited liability company and it was entitled to exemption, then so be it. You no, know, um, but obviously. Like I said, that matter isn't settled, and uh, a lot of uh, analysis is actually involved uh, in advising clients on that matter. So you may have situations where some education institutions have been paying taxes in the past, but what's clear is they need, you know, to engage with professionals so that they can be properly advised. And if there are legitimate ways of managing the exposure, you know, they should obviously um, explore those options. Uh, to manage the exposure on. It's, it's an area we have expertise in and we're able to advise on. Yeah, it's it's nice that you even mentioned that because um, a participant just made, asked if the um, amendment to Section 23.1c will be applied retrospectively. So I think that question has somewhat been answered by your um, last statement. Um, a question here, um, a participant is asking, with this new, will this new act, with this new act, are the booksellers going to pay VAT? Oh, sorry, this is on VAT, <laughs> but I don't know if this is with respect to educational institutions. I think VAT is, um, is different from 
the provision of section 23.1c and VAT would apply to all um, suppliers that are making supplies in Nigeria. So I guess that would answer your question. Yes, yeah, so, uh, if, if, if I would comment on that, you know, you know, maybe let me just look at it from two perspectives. The first is, if you are looking at booksellers and you are looking at them from a corporate income tax point of view, um, booksellers are even when the, there was exemption for educational institutions, I don't think booksellers were considered as educational institutions, and so there's never been an exemption, a specific exemption for booksellers, and so they should they've been liable to tax and they should continue to pay tax. You know, of course, if they are profitable, you know, that's when corporate income tax kicks in. Uh, regarding sale of, of books, you know, books qual qualify, you know, should qualify. Looking at the definition of educational materials in the finance, in, in the VAT Act as amended up, uh, to date, there was an amendment by the VAT Modification Act, uh, VAT Modification Order 2021. Um, books generally, uh, as long as they relate to primary, secondary, or tertiary education in Nigeria, should qualify for VAT exemption, you know, based on you know the the VAT Act as amended. And so, books of booksellers need to look at the kind of supplies they are making. The valuable supplies will obviously be liable to VAT, but if there are VAT exempt supplies then those VAT exempt supplies will not be liable to VAT. Yeah, thank you, Akwali. Um, an attendee just said, um, in case an education institution makes losses, won't minimum tax apply? Yeah, so if an education institution makes losses, minimum, the minimum tax provision in section 33 of the CIT Act will apply that you know, if it is a limited liability company, not a charitable organization. So if it's a, a for-profit educational institution, you know, and it makes losses, then it would be liable to minimum tax. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, I think maybe the related clarification that maybe needs to be made is that, okay. you know, going forward, you may have situations where um, corporate, corporate, organizations that pay tuition to educational institution. Maybe, you know, you have some corporate organizations that um, as part of some incentives that they give to their employees, they may pay the tuition of some of their employees' um, children. You know? So if you have corporate organizations that are paying um, tuition to somebody, to taxable for-profit educational institutions, you no, know, you may have a scenario where withholding tax would now be deductible from those tuition payments, you know, so that those organizations are also, you know, compliant with the provisions of the law. But that won't be a general issue because I think generally most of the people that pay tuition are individuals and they are not likely to qualify as person within the definition of um, person in the withholding tax regulations in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you, Akimali. Okay, um, in your opinion, do you think the imposition of excise duty on non-alcoholic carbonated and sweetened beverages is an effective means of raising revenue for the health sector as implied by the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning? That's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, that, that's a tricky question. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of the controversial <clears throat> uh, legislative changes. I, I think it's in line with the trend <clears throat> that we've seen globally. Excuse me. It's in line with the trend that we've seen globally where countries have imposed sugar tax. You know, so even players in the sector, I think they knew that um, it was going to apply at some point, uh, to be fair. I think 
you know, players in the sector, I believe they would know because I mean the handwriting on the wall was always, always very legible. Um, I think what was missing was the process of engagement. And I think that's something that's very critical, very critical. I think there needs to be engagement uh, by the government with the private sector, with affected businesses uh, to ensure that um, this, this, the introduction of the, of the excise duty, it's 10 era per liter, you know, that it's done at the right level. The question for instance is, why is it 10 naira per liter? Why not 20 naira per liter? Why not 1 naira per liter? What's the science behind that? So, so the Ministry of Finance may need to demonstrate to the stakeholders the reasoning, the logic behind the level of excise duty that has been imposed so that you know, they can demonstrate that, okay, you know, this is, this is uh, consistent with what's been applied in other jurisdictions or you know, this analysis has been done. Maybe an analysis has been done to show the, the threshold that can still be passed on to, to, con, to customers or to consumers. Because, I mean, there is an assumption that the consumption of, of um, th those kind of drinks, uh, uh, non-alcoholic uh, sweetened beverages, that, that it's, the demand is inelastic. But when one looks at the current economic situation in Nigeria, you know, one may need to really review and evaluate that assumption. You know, is it correct? What level of excise duty you know, will be appropriate to introduce? You know, should it be modulated? You know, so that maybe you start from a low level and then increase it gradually. Um, because if you just introduce something from zero to 10 era per liter, the, the impact, you know, there, there may be a shock, you know, when when consumers uh, see the new prices. So, so I think there needs to be engagement. It's clear that that amendment is in line with global trends. It's just that there needs to be engagement, so that if a revision is to be done during the course of the year or in the finance bill 2022, you know, the stakeholders in in the sectors affected, you know, can engage with government. And ensure that whatever needs to be done is done. Uh, th that would be my comment on that. So I think it's 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 an area that that needs more more work. I will definitely be shocked at the price of Coca Cola <laughs> when I want to grab my bottle of Coca Cola next. <laughs> well, I doubt that. Okay, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I know that. No, it's the ten dollar per liter. If you look at a 33 CL bottle, you know, that's like a three naira 33 cobo increase in the price. Um, so, so I think it may appear that it's not so significant, but then uh, the businesses are the ones that know their businesses best. And yeah. it, that's why it's so important for government to engage with them so that they can also you know, provide fact-based uh, reasons for why the level is too high and you know what the way forward should be. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So moving on to um, the Nigeria Police Trust Fund levy. Um, the Nigerian Police Trust Fund Act was signed in 2019. That was when it was first introduced. And the modalities for the payment of the levy were then introduced in the Finance Act 2021. A company is only required to comply with this act going forward, or is there a requirement to account for the levy from 2019 when the act was first signed? Okay, thanks, Okoyemi. You know, I, I think um, based on the laws in Nigeria, when you look at the Acts Authentication Act and the Interpretation Act in Nigeria, when the president signs an, a bill, when the president assents to a bill, um, that bill, if another effective date is not specified, that bill will come into force from the date the bill was assented to. Uh, that happened in 2019, I think, maybe June of 2019 or thereabout. Uh, so that means the provision came into force from that time. Uh, companies that had not filed their <clears throat> returns at the time the bill was signed into law, they will be caught up. No, by that provision. Companies had filed their return for the ready back of assessment before the bill was signed into law. 
No, they may not be liable. That's in 2019. No, so companies just need to evaluate um, which years are affected. Are they affected? You know, from 2019 and then 2020 uh, and 2021, and now they will be affected in 2022. Or you know, is it just something? You know, yeah. So they need to evaluate that because the provision has always been in place. The fact that the administrative procedure for remitting the tax was not um, specified would not change the fact that companies were liable from when they became, you know, like whether in 2019 or in 2020, depending on what their financial year was. And, you know, at the point when they filed, you know, they had an obligation to file their, their return. So, so that's what needs to be done. So it's not a going forward thing. Uh, there has been a liability from prior years and that needs to be looked at. Some companies are booked provisions, uh, hopefully, you know, I'm aware of companies that booked provisions, so that shouldn't be an issue for them. You know, when the tax authority communicates the modernities for remittance, you know, they will remit the taxes, but companies that haven't booked provisions will need to, you know, look at that and book provisions for the affected years. So the affected years may vary for, for, from company to company. It would also depend on whether the company had, you know, net profit during that period. Yeah, and it's nice that you talked about um, net profit because um, the Finance Act doesn't give a definition for net profit. And we know that um, the levy is 0.05% of a company's net profit. So um, in your view, what do you think, um, what profit base do you think companies need to rely on um, for the purpose of determining the levy? Thanks, Okwemi. That, that's a good question. Um, I think in practice, uh, we've seen many companies apply profit after tax, as profit after companies income tax, education tax, after all the other income taxes, you know, as the base for determining their Nigeria Police Trust Fund levy. And I think that's a reasonable basis. You know, the reason for that is because, you know, Nigeria applies the international financial reporting standards, that's the accounting standard applicable in Nigeria. And IFRS does not define net profit. So net profit is really uh, supposed to be an accounting or a financial reporting terminology. But unfortunately, there's no standard that defines what net profit is. So it's not clear whether it should be profit before tax or you know, or profit after tax. But what we've seen is in many companies applying profit after tax, and you know we think it's a reasonable basis for computing for computing the tax. Um, I would say that maybe it would be necessary for future for there to be future legislative amendment to clarify the definition, so that you know it's not just based on practice, but you know it's clearly defined in the law, and there's there's no gray area. Um, in the in on that issue. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, um, generally speaking, if we go back to the Companies Income Tax Act, um, Section thirty three on the reduced minimum tax rate um, brought about brought about by the um, Finance Act, are taxpayers at liberty to choose? the two accounting periods, the reduced minimum tax rate would apply to? Yeah, thanks for coming. So there is a provision in section 33 that empowers taxpayers to choose the financial periods that it would apply to, whether, you know, in 2019 and 2020, that's the two consecutive years, or 2020 and 2021, you know, calendar years, you know. So the financial periods fall into those, falling into those uh, um, calendar years. You know, taxpayers are at liberty to choose either of them. So it's either you are choosing 2019 and 2020, or you are choosing 2020 and 2021. That flexibility is there, and taxpayers need to do an evaluation so that they can, you know, choose the option or choose the years that would um, minimize their tax liability. Uh, I think, you know, the relief is in recognition of the fact that, you know, times are hard. COVID has really impacted negatively on many businesses. And the relief that has been provided 
you know, by the Nigerian legislature, by the Nigerian government, you know, needs to be maximized by taxpayers. The relief is, is time sensitive. So, uh, you know, once you don't take advantage of it, or once you don't optimize it by doing proper evaluation, then it's, it's, it's not something that you can enjoy in future. So that, that review needs to be done by taxpayers and the flexibility is deliberate you know, by the Nigerian legislature. Yeah, um, um, and, and there's a question here from a participant, Fatai Abdul. He, made, he asked that um, for companies that have year end other than December, how would they benefit from the extension of the period um, of the minimum tax reduction rate, given that it lapses in December 2021? No, the wording of the legislation is such that you know financial years ending in those relevant years would so regardless of the financial year end of a company, the company would have had a financial year that ended in 2019 and would have a financial year that ended in 2020, or would have a financial year that ended in 2021. So regardless of the financial year end. I think companies will still be able to, to benefit. You know, maybe we should read out the provision of the of, of that amendment so that you know it's clear um, to to pass on. So what the law says is for the purpose of subsection one, the minimum tax to be levied and paid shall be 0.5% of gross turnover of the company less from the investment income, provided that the applicable minimum tax is reduced to 0.25% for tax returns prepared and filed with respect to financial years ending on any date between. So it's about the end of the financial years, not the fact that the financial years must fall within you know, the period. So if you have financial years ending on any date you know, between 2020 and 2021, both this inclusive, you know, that's the exemption. This is where a company had filed its relevant tax returns for any year of assessment, falling on any date between 1st January 2020. So the, if the years of assessment fall on any date between 1st January 2020 and 31st December 2021, both this inclusive, the applicable minimum tax rate is reduced to 0.25% for tax returns prepared and filed for any two accounting periods ending on any date between 1st January 2019 and 31st December 2021. So what's important is for taxpayers to evaluate which financial years ended in 2019. What would my minimum tax liability have been? You know, what would be the savings if I were to apply the relief? You know, same thing for 2020, the financial year that ended. What's the minimum tax liability relating to the tax return for that financial period? And then for 2021, you know, what's the savings? So comparing the savings, you know, 2019 and 2020 or 2020 and 2021, a determination can be made of, you know, on which which of the two scenarios would yield the greatest savings. And, you know, I think taxpayers should maximize that opportunity. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Akiwali. Um, there's also a question, um, just before we move on to the, the next question, um, from Agnes. She says, do we have precedence on interpretation of profit before tax from a tax perspective? Now, I'm okay. not sure if this question is in relation to the net profit or just regular profit before tax in computing um, your total profits. Um, so maybe if you can just answer from both perspectives. Okay, so I, I think the question will be in relation to the comments I'd made on the Nigeria Police Trust Fund levy. I think it's possible. And so, you know, the tax law does not define what is what constitutes profit before tax. In fact, the tax law doesn't really define the term profits, <laughs> but it uses it several times. Uh, and I think the understanding, you know, when one has an holistic, when one takes a holistic view of the provisions of the law, the understanding is that profits comprises any 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 form of gain or profit or income that is earned you know, by a company. Now, the tax law doesn't define what is what constitutes profits before tax, 
And so reliance is always placed on the accounting standards, you know, from for practical purposes. But of course, you know, the tax law itself, there's no format for preparing tax computations in the tax law itself. Um, so what, what practitioners simply do and based on, you know, um, the prevailing practice that has evolved over time is to then look at the profit before tax that is reported in line with the applicable accounting standard, which currently is IFRS. You know, you know, look at that, rely on that, and then make adjustments to that profit before tax to maybe add other profits that may not be embedded in the profits before tax for the relevant financial year, and to exclude exempt profits or non-taxable profits that are included in the profit before tax for that year. So there's no definition of profit before tax in the law. And there's no, I'm not aware of any judicial precedent on what constitutes profit before tax. I think the understanding has always been that that is the terrain that you know, the accounting standards you know, should act as an authority in. And you know, it's whatever the accounting standards then refer to as profit before tax that is considered as profit before tax. But necessary adjustments are made in the tax computations of companies in line with the tax with in line with relevant tax law provisions. Yeah. Um, thank you, Akiwali. Um, I think um, another question here on minimum tax now. Um, the Okoyami is asking that for a company that had filed returns till 2020 December, for example, how will that company claim the new relief in respect of minimum tax? Okay, so for companies that have filed tax returns up to 2020, so I presume that the the, the, um, the person that asked the question um, maybe is working for a company that uh, did not claim the relief in 2019, in the return filed in respect of the financial year ended 2019, and in respect of the financial year ended 2020. In that case, uh, you know, to the extent that the return was filed on time, now maybe we'll talk about this in more detail later. To the extent that the return was filed on time, then the company would enjoy the relief. The company would enjoy the relief, and. The company needs to write to the tax authorities, you know, because tax returns are filed on tax pro max. It's difficult to make adjustments without engaging with the tax authorities. So the company will need to write the tax authorities, um, the tax office where, with which it, it is registered to notify them of its intention to take advantage of the provisions of the law of the, of the Companies Income Tax Act as amended. You now, and to refine its returns, companies are empowered based on the law. I think section 90 or 91 of the CIT Act empowers the company to refine its tax returns. And also refile the tax returns, uh, just notify the tax authority of their intention to refile the tax returns in order to claim the relief. And you know, claim the relief if there needs to be engagement with the tax pro max team uh, in Abuja or with the tax policy and advisory department of the finance of the Federal and Revenue Service, then that, that that would have to be done. But if the law has provided a relief for taxpayers. No, that relief has to be granted because you know, tax administration in Nigeria is based on tax law provisions. And if there are tax law provisions, they have to be respected. Exactly. And it's nice that you mentioned that, Akewali, because my next question is with respect to companies who have filed their tax returns late. So um, with the introduction of a new section 55.8 um, of CETA, uh, for companies that are entitled to claim minimum tax relief um, but have filed their affected companies' income tax returns late. Uh, my question is, what is that? What will be the implication for such companies? Well, you know, um, Section 55 it is a very interesting provision. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. And the section essentially counteracts the relief that a taxpayer should <clears throat> enjoy from minimum tax from the minimum from the reduced minimum tax rate by imposing a fine you know to the tune of that relief <laughs> now, so what it means is for a taxpayer that filed its tax returns late that taxpayer will not be entitled to the 
ready for you to enjoy the river, it will also be reliable to a fine. So effectively, uh, it won't it won't be entitled to the relief. But you know, I think what one needs to take note of is this, because there are questions that they need to be asked. Now, the FIRS, you know, especially in respect of 2021, the FIRS extended the due date of filing. You know, for many companies, it was June, it was extended to July, and then it was later extended up till December. And so to the extent that a company filed its tax return for 2021 year of assessment within the extended time, because the tax authority is empowered to extend the due date of filing. No, so if the due date of filing has been extended and the return has been filed, then it's going to be difficult for the tax authority to apply this provision in respect of 2021, because you know it has, the tax authority exercises its powers in extending the due date of filing. And it was because of obvious reasons. There were significant teething issues with tax pro max. And that might have affected taxpayers as well. You know, I'm aware of many companies whose withholding tax credit position wasn't reflected on tax pro max. And they were not going to cough out money in a difficult economic situation to pay tax. You know, when they had withholding tax credit had not been recognized by the tax authorities. So you know, the practical realities have to be considered and you know, the bottom line is, if the due date of filing, for instance, in 2021, was extended up till 31st December, then companies that filed their returns by that extended due date of filing should still be eligible to take advantage of the minimum tax relief relating to 2021. For prior year, that's 2020. That may be difficult if a company didn't file the return on time. But you know, for 2021, I think a strong argument can be made in that regard. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Akiwali. Um, and I think that already um, answers um, this question, which is that um, the participant is asking that in the real sense of it, that will the minimum tax benefits only apply to 2021 FY? given that um, there's that late returns penalty. Um, and I think maybe in 2020, if we look at it, I think the FIRS also did some sort of extension because of the uh, effect of the pandemic on companies. Um, so the participant is then asking now that um, if I choose to file 2020 FY and 2021 FY accounts, can I still enjoy the tax benefits? Um, I think the participant is just about to file the returns because he's saying there's still a clause that says the tax returns must not be filed, date, which is what you just talked about. So um, I think you may have answered that question somewhat, but um, if you just yeah, want to so, further clarify. Yeah, so for, for companies that are just looking at filing their returns for 2020 year of assessment or 2021 year of assessment, um, I think this provision of Section 55.8 would have caught up with them um, because that means the return is being filed late. So they would be exposed to a penalty equal to the relief, the minimum tax relief, and essentially it defeats the, the, minimum, the, the, the benefit. You know, it basically overrides the benefit. Um, I, I think maybe what one should do at this point is emphasize the need for taxpayers to file their returns on time. Because I think the, the, the lawmakers are trying to introduce conditions and piece of legislation that would ensure that it's only, risk, only compliant taxpayers that would benefit from such incentives. So this is an example where a minimum tax relief is available but it is only available to companies that filed their returns on time. So companies should, you know, just endeavor to file their returns on time, you know, going forward, so that whatever benefits, aside from avoiding uh, penalties, late filing penalties, late payment penalties, they may also be eligible uh, for reliefs like this that are introduced in tax laws. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that really answers um, the questions on the minimum tax reduced rate. And just to recap, it's um, if a company is just filing the minimum tax computations, then that company may not be able to enjoy the reduced minimum tax rate because of the 
because of the fact that the returns are being filed late. But if a company has already filed the returns and now wants to enjoy the reduced minimum tax rate, then the company can write to the FIRS um, requesting um, a recomputation of their minimum tax computation and requesting for the reduced minimum tax rate. Um, another question just popped in. Um, how realistic are the chances to get the minimum tax relief as FIRS has not been forthcoming? My company is just reluctant to further push the process and I intend to go the full hog. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think it's, I think the tax authority, like I mentioned earlier on, tax administration ultimately is based on tax law provisions. Uh, the issue um, with the amendment made by the Finance Act 2020 was that there was some greatness to it. It wasn't so clear, it wasn't unequivocal. Um, and so the tax authority used a an interpretation of the law that, that wasn't favorable to taxpayers. Uh, many companies wrote to the tax authorities and their requests were declined by the tax authorities. Well, with the amendment that's been made by the Finance Act 2021, I think it's crystal clear that companies are entitled to the relief. And we know the tax authority to be a law abiding agency, law abiding tax authority an administrator. So I'm sure the tax authorities would comply with the provisions of the law. Now companies shouldn't, companies need to push, companies need to write. And if the tax authority still declines to grant a relief that is enshrined in the law, then companies need to escalate the issue for adjudication to the tax appeal tribunal. You know, th that's why all those frameworks are put in place in Nigerian tax laws so that taxpayers can really enjoy whatever benefits, you know, can enforce their rights. And, and as, as they pay taxes and they are compliant, whatever incentives or benefits, they can also enjoy them fully. Yes, yes, absolutely, Akiwali. Um, a lot of participants are asking about the recorded chats. Um, you can go on Facebook and go to KPMG Nigeria handle and check for videos. You will be able to see the recorded videos and um, look back at some of the questions and responses um yeah. I, I think the recording would also be uploaded to youtube later on so they can also yes. check uh yes and you can use youtube channel okay yes so you can check kpmg nigeria's youtube channel to um look check for the recording um, maybe one last question before we um, call it a day, um, and this is with respect to um, what is your response to tax auditors who adjust revenue to match the sales reported in VAT returns, if reported VAT sales are higher than the revenue reported for CIT purposes. Their approach should be based on the law and tax points for VAT is different. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's frustrating, but, but you know, it's one of the real challenges that one faces. Um, based on the law, VAT is collected in Nigeria, at least output VAT is collected in Nigeria on cash basis, right? So if a company raises an invoice, for instance, on on a customer and the customer doesn't pay. So let me, let me just give an example. So I'm a company, I raise an invoice, just one invoice, I have just one customer. I raise an invoice of a hundred million naira on that customer. And you know, maybe I raise it in November um, of, of, of that year, say November, 2021, and the customer doesn't pay. Um, and so I'm not able to remit the VAT because the customer has not paid the VAT over. Um, the tax authority, well, for financial reporting purposes, I may recognize revenue of a hundred million. So the tax authority looks at my books for that year and says, okay, uh, you the, the revenue you generated was above the VAT cadence of 25 million. So, I mean, you, you should have obligations. Um, and the returns that you filed showed zero output VAT because I mean, you no, know, maybe up till that period, 
there was no vertebral revenue. Um, so you could have that scenario where the turnover per VAT returns for 2021 for that company is zero Leg and legitimately so because you know the VAT reported the VAT reported for VAT filing purposes based on section 15 of the VAT Act is on cash basis. What the law says is the VAT collected shall be called output tax, not the VAT collectible, the VAT collected. Mm -hmm. So, so it's based on cash. Now, for financial reporting purposes, a separate set of rules apply. So if I've provided this service and I mean uh, and you know and uh, economic benefits would accrue to me by virtue of the provision of the service, based on IFRS, IFRS 15, I think, you know, revenue would be recognized. You know, so the fact that revenue has been recognized on a crowd basis does not mean you know. VAT has been evaded. It just means the VAT has not been paid. You know, when in maybe in the following year the VAT is paid over, then the taxpayer will recognize the the turnover as part of its valuable turnover for the year and report the VAT accordingly. So I think tax authorities need to be aware of this. Some of their bridged procedures adopted by tax authorities during tax audits, they are not in line with the tax laws. And not, I think taxpayers should be encouraged to take advantage of the channels for arbitration, you know, for adjudication you know, that's been provided, either by escalating it you know, to higher levels of the tax of the FRS, or even going to the tax appeal tribunal. The more judgments we have, the more the judicial precedents we have on issues in, in dispute, the, the better, the deeper the Nigerian tax jurisprudence would be and you know, more, more enjoyable Nigerian tax practice would be. Because then you have a lot of things, you can, a lot of judgments you can refer to you know, when one engages with tax authorities uh, because of taxpayers that have insisted on enforcing their rights. And they have won cases at the Tax Appeal Tribunal. You know, I think it's good to know that the tax appeal tribunal has been a very um, has been a has, has been a good umpire. You know, there have been cases won by the tax authorities. There have been cases won by taxpayers, and so it's always based on the merits of each case. And, and I think that's a good development. That's a good thing in Nigeria. Thank you so much, Akawale. Um, we really value the insights that you have provided today on the Finance Act 2021. Um, we're sorry we'll not be able to take all the questions today as time will not permit us, but um, you can please send your questions to NGFM Tax Inquiries at ng.kpmg.com. Um, the email address will be dropped in the chat box, so you can then copy it and then send your questions to that email address and we'll definitely provide responses to your questions. Um, once again, I would like to say thank you to the participants. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today for this session of the of KPMG social media tax chat. We really appreciate you joining us. And I'll also say thank you again to Akinwale for sharing such valuable insights. Um, we really, really um, appreciate your contributions. And I think the participants would definitely go home with um, so many um, things that they will need to apply to their businesses. They will definitely need to review the impact of the Finance Act on their businesses. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.
news icon. The seamless scroll makes it simple to view all news at a glance. You have news you've already seen and want to go back to, just search. Expand or share each news item to your friends with the dedicated buttons. Adjust your news preference easily from the settings icon and tailor your content. We have embedded tax legislation and popular cases in our tax laws section. Are you eager to know more about taxation in Nigeria? KPMG Tax App has more than enough for you. Stay on the cutting edge of industry updates with insights features. The new app brings together alerts, newsletters, articles and publications from industry-leading KPMG professionals. You don't have to worry about missing important regulatory dates and other notable events. The notable date feature brings them all into one place in a calendar or list however you want to view them. For the average employee, entrepreneur or business person, KPMG Tax App has another important feature. The PIT Calculator. Plug and play, simple as it gets. Impute the required numbers and calculate your taxes. Also, the app has jokes and valuable tips. Check in to learn something new and fun. Still feel there's more to know? We've got your back. Ask an expert and get quick, insightful responses from KPMG professionals when in doubt. Learn more from various authorities through recommended links in the external links tab. Read all about us to find out more about KPMG's service offerings, our responsible tax principles and disclaimer. It's now a breeze to connect with us online. Just click on the link icon on the home page to get to us on social media. KPMG Talks Up, connecting with you on the go.